Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 107, Keep It Simple, Ways Board Game Designers Make Games Easier to Learn and Teach. I'm Sean, who's had his Windsor Pizza fix, and with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, missing those Panzerati, Moti. Yeah. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to welcome everyone in the lobby here on Twitch. You too can join us Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash Tabletop Bellhop. You know what we should throw in there? We should throw in the Toronto, New York. That seems to, people seem to know that better than Eastern. People know New York time or Toronto time. I, I know I've started to do it on the social media when I'm talking to people about when things are going live. It's usually not like our scheduled every nine o'clock. Everyone right. kind of knows when we go live, but like something else, like I'm going to unbox something at around seven. And I've had people like, oh, I thought that was going to be in an hour and it's in two. Oh, okay. So I just started throwing in the New York Toronto because more people seem to know that. Okay. Might be worth tossing in there. All right, Tanane's, 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 I don't even know what that means. I'm just trying to mess with the closed captioning. So for those of you here live, we have something awesome and new. We have added captioning, but this is being done by a piece of software live. So it sometimes messes things up. Uh, for those on YouTube, hopefully you can see it too. We're testing that. Let's try it again. Tonight's main topic is a follow-up to last week where we highlighted 15 games that are much easier than they seem. Heavy games that we sat down and were like, wow, this isn't so bad. Tonight, what we're going to talk about, though, is what makes those games easier. Things designers can do to make playing and learning their games easier. After that discussion, we'll be headed to the game room where I have a read review of the Tales of the Loop RPG starter set from Free League Publishing and a card game called Animal Empires. It's an anthropomorphic engine building or empire building, not engine building. There's no engines built in that game at all, actually. It's, it's a pretty far from engine building. Uh, area control empire building card game. We wrap up with the Bellhops tabletop where I actually got out Vinhos Deluxe and sipped some of that heavy, heavy wine. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. Each week, we're going to highlight some of our interaction with you fine folk. We'll share some feedback we've received, comments on our content, and maybe some gaming discussions we've been part of. We want to share what people are saying, both positive and negative. We appreciate your comments and suggestions, and if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. And in case anyone's confused, Mo is M-O-E, not just M-O, which I noticed a few people getting wrong, so maybe we should probably say both. You can also hit us up on social media. Um, I can be found everywhere. Tabletop, bellhop, one word, all together, mashed together. And I can be found as Dark Elf LX, all one word. Now, up first, a comment from Chris Groff on the topic of RPGs, artifacts, and mementos. <laughs> My most favorite artifact from our gaming sessions was a series of comic strips one member of our group made based more on our table talk than in-game talk, <laughs> but it characterized and captured us and our dynamic pretty well. That is an awesome artifact right there. I, I don't. We, we have a comic strip out there written by Carl, um, Kyle Farron, I think it was, um, D20 Monkey who did a comic of a story from an RPG we had. That's because he was looking at submissions back when he was a new writer and had a new web comic. Like something the players created at the table, fantastic. All right, well, next up, a couple of comments on our Sanctum review. First up, Sid Seifing says, my wife and I just learned Sanctum this week. We found it a lot of fun and not a small bit challenging. Mm. And Brian McDonald's wrote, between this and the Jagged Alliance board game, both of which are about resource, action, point management, and improving gear, which do you choose? Well, thanks for the comment, Sild and Brian. Uh, regarding Sanctum versus Jagged Alliance, I'm sorry to say I haven't tried it, so I can't help you out there, Brian. Uh, maybe someone in our chat room will have played it. If uh, When we get to the lobby, we can point that out. So if anyone's played both Sanctum and Jagged Alliance, or just played Jagged Alliance, because I can talk to you about Sanctum, we can figure out a mesh between it. But unfortunately, it's not one I played, so I couldn't tell you, Brian, sorry. Well, next up, some thanks for our Animal Empire unboxing. Jack Morgan, thanks so much for doing an unboxing video. I'm so glad you liked what you see. 
Jack, Half Monster Games designer. <laughs> now that was on the YouTube video. Jack also took the time to send a private message on Facebook to add, it was a really nice and fair review. I really appreciate the balance and the feedback too. All right. Oh, well, first off, I have to apologize, Jack, for sharing what's a private message, but I figured that wasn't, there wasn't anything <laughs> damning in there or anything like that. And I guess I love it. I, we mention this every time it happens. I love it when the game designer takes the time to check out content created by content creators like us. That's always great to see. Um, and I do like the fact that Jack took the cons the criticisms I had constructively, right? He liked that it was a balanced and fair review, which is awesome. That's what I like to see. Unlike we've had a couple publishers in the past who didn't take our thoughts also well. Well, sticking with unboxing videos, Angela Murray left this comment on our Tales from the Loop starter set unboxing video. I missed this, but did it have any blank character sheets or just the pre-mades that came with? I love that you noticed there was no computer geek. Well, thanks for the comment, Ange. Uh, Ange is actually one of two GMs I've actually played Tales from the Loop under. Ange runs a fantastic Tales from the Loop game that always features the same characters. I am sorry to say that no, there are no character sheets in this box set. Uh, no blank character sheets. There's five characters in it, but no blank ones. This was like the big thing they left out and the, and the teaser to buy more, right? To go get the full game. Go get the full game so you can make your own characters. And I feel bad too, because obviously when I was doing the unboxing video, I missed the computer geek. There is a computer geek. I don't know how I missed it going through. There were five of them. I don't know if I didn't look at every sheet. So I'm sorry, there is a computer geek, but there is not a rocker that I could find. I double check that. Um, there's no rocker in this box, but there is a computer geek. Well, we'll be talking more about this starter set uh, once we get to the game room second segment in the second half of the show. And now, a couple of comments on our breakdancing meeple review. Joe Swick, one-time patron of the show, stopped by to say, this looks fun. Hmm? And Eric Paquette commented, I love the fact that each color has different designs. As hmm. someone who is colorblind, I feel it is needed and a great way of doing it while staying within the theme of the game. Well, thanks, Joe and Eric. To be honest, I never even considered the art on the meeples having an impact to accessibility of the game. That's a great catch there. Something I just like, eh, it's a nice touch. It's not really needed. And I'm like, you know what? By doing that, they made the game more accessible, which is awesome. Now, finally, we have a number of comments on our Exit the Game Haunted Roller Coaster review. And here's a few highlights. Jim Pinto, I tried playing Polar Station. I hated it. <laughs> And I love puzzles. Now, I just want to note, this is from me. This one, that Polar Station is from 2017. Mm -hmm. And as we commented during that roller coaster review, they have really been improving with time. Yeah. So going back to their earlier games is problematic. Now, Scott A. Woodward said, that was the first one we played. It was a good one. And Eric Farmer, I think this is the best starting one. Mm -hmm. Finally, Christopher McKeon I like exit games, but I always get to the point where it becomes more arts and crafts than a puzzle, and I feel the time ticking away. Hmm. I also play predominantly solo. All right, interesting mix of views. Uh, what I like about that is it shows that these games obviously aren't for everyone. Um, Jim is one of the most opinionated gamers I've ever met in my life, so I'm not surprised that he didn't enjoy them, but Sean is right. There is a chance, it's just one of the older ones. I haven't played Polar Station, so I don't know how it compares to the ones I played, but I know personally there was one out of the three I played I wasn't a big fan of. So there is a chance, Jim, you might wanna give one another one another try, but totally up to you. Now, the comment that stuck with me the most here though was Eric Farmer's comment, or sorry, Christopher's, Christopher McKeon's comment about arts and crafts. And that is a thing, actually something didn't ever bring up in any of the reviews. Like we've always talked about the need for scissors, but I'd say in the last one in particular, we spent probably 20 minutes just cutting and folding things. And there were three of us. And even with three of us, we were playing, we had one pair of scissors. There was a point where there was something we had to cut and we actually sent Big G upstairs to get a second pair of scissors just to speed it up. And man, I could see being solo that would take three times longer so yeah this is definitely a thing um same with the other exit games like every one we've had i think has involved cutting something and sometimes it's cutting things with small details so that when you put them on other things you can see things again i don't want to spoil anything but like you have to be exact in your cutting it's not necessarily just a snip 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 it's sometimes you need to cut things out closely um i i don't know i don't i don't know if it's a problem um 
I will say it gets stressful. Like when you know you're on a time limit and you're not a scissor whiz, you definitely feel that stress. But again, I don't know if that's a bad thing. That's just a thing. It's part of the game. Right. Uh, thanks all of you, uh, Scott, Christopher, Jim, and Eric, for the comments on our Haunted Roller Coaster review. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Thanks to everyone who shares, comments, and interacts with our content. A few announcements before we continue, and one quick note. Our Star Trek game ran out of Red Meeple once again, so you can help out by stopping by our Patreon or subscribing to our content wherever it's found. Sign up to receive the Tabletop Bellhop weekly newsletter in your inbox. Once a week, I send out an email. It uh, recaps all the content we produce in the week previous. That's blog posts, podcast episodes, reviews, unboxings, actual plays, all there in one place. You can sign up by going over to tabletopbellhop.com where you can find a spot to subscribe in the sidebar or go over to newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com. Uh, just a quick reminder that we do have an AMA coming up. That's going to be in two weeks. If you can't join us live and have a short topic you'd like us to cover, you can always hit us up on social media, send us a voicemail, or email questions at tabletopbellhop.com. All right, our Harry Potter Hogwarts battle giveaway is going strong. Uh, we launched this one in celebration of getting partner status on YouTube, which has been really cool. And we want to reward those who made it possible. This one is open to all of our YouTube subscribers, new and old. Yeah, just head over to the blog. It's the pin post, tabletopbellhop.com, and you can enter right there. Speaking of giveaways, earlier this week, uh, Tech2674, who's in our chat room right now, a uh, local gamer, gave me a heads up. He's like, hey, did you guys announce the Grinto winner? And I'm sorry, we totally forgot. Well, we forgot. Sorry about that. The announcement should have been in last week's show. Yeah, that's my bad completely. Um, we had a delay. Um, the email I sent to the winner got into their spam box, and thankfully they logged into um, Rafflecopter with Facebook, so I was able to find them on Facebook and tell them, hey, Facebook, make sure, or hey, I don't want to say, hey, Ron, we'll get to that in a second. Hey, Ron, check your, check your emails. They checked it, found it, and we've got it figured out. But because of all that, that all happened Wednesday before the show. I'm like, good, it's done. It's, it's all set up. I got a hold of Market Graham Gamers Guild. I got them talking to each other. Everything was set and I was good to go. I totally forgot that I didn't let everyone know. So we have people out there still hoping they were going to win, right? Like still waiting for the announcement. So I do feel bad about that. No, no more delays. The winner was Ronald M. from Illinois. Yeah, Ronald, congratulations. And I do have to thank everyone who entered that giveaway. That was one of our most successful yet as far as numbers. Again, we do apologize for some of the technical difficulties. Uh, we are having the same thing. Rafflecopter does not like Chrome somehow and on, on Android specifically. Um, if you do go to it on Chrome and it's not working, just refresh. Like it's at the point now where it works most of the time, but sometimes it doesn't. And it's a buffering issue where if it takes too long for Rafflecopter to load, it errors out instead of giving you the widget. And it's just a page loading issue. And it's, we've been trying, Deanna and I have spent three days trying to get it and we've got it at a point where it's better. It loads most of the time or just go on your computer, borrow your friend's iPhone. I don't know, find some other way. It's definitely worth entering. It's a solid game. Well, we love people who drop in and take part in our chat room, The Lobby. If you are here live, remember to stick around as we continue the show after the double bell with more chat and content that otherwise only our patrons get. We got a pretty quiet lobby right now. Um, we had a lot of talk in the pre-show. So for those of you who do join us live, we go, we go live, Sean and I go <laughs> on the air Long before we start actually recording the podcast, uh, for a variable amount of time. Usually it's like at least 20 minutes, sometimes it's half an hour. And in the pre-show today, what we were talking about was our new feature where we've added closed captioning to all of our videos, which hopefully will help out some um, people with accessibility issues and make our, our content more accessible for more people, which is always a good thing to do. So um, we talked about that for a bit. Um, Deanna was pointing out the tale of the Rangers folly was the, the comic that got made by D20 monkey. Um, that was a, it was basically a story about um, it, it, it's our group's version of don't split the party. And it was my friend Eugene was playing a Ranger who always had to go off on their own. And he went off on their own and 
found the room through of, full of carrying crawlers, and this was AD and D second edition. And if anyone remembers carrying crawlers in AD and D second edition, they do one point of damage, and they're not that dangerous. But every time you have to make one of those poison saves, or pe- save versus uh, petrolit. I can't say petrolization. Per- what is that petrification. word? Petrification. That's the word I'm looking for. Petrification. Thank you. I don't know what happened there. Petrification. And of course, he sat there killing like carrying crawler after carrying crawler after carrying crawler to eventually fail his save and then slowly die, even though he had 98 hit points as carrying crawlers slowly digested him. And then that became the tale of the Ranger's Folly. And anytime in any of my groups going on past them, whenever someone says, I'm going to go off on my own, instead of my group going, don't split the party, they always say, no, remember the tale of the Ranger's Folly folly and that's oh right and they don't split the party uh and th- thank you animal leslie for the subscription that's greatly yep. appreciated and thanks to may suggins who subscribed earlier in the show uh i just want to note uh can anyone in the ch- uh, who's watching live tell me have you been hearing the bells during the scene changes um uh, i'm not hearing them on my end and that concerns me because that means you guys might not be hearing them either i never hear them so no you I never hear tell them you. um so <laughs> So they're ma- magic bells. I'd have yeah. to hit the bells. Okay, you guys are hearing them. Okay, it's good. Um, I, I, I've had some weird audio. There you go. You become fossil fuel. Uh, oh, I actually just noticed Jeff Seuss is in the chat room. I, I this is this is a good timing. I am going to have to call out Jeff Seuss. We're in the lobby here. Uh, everyone, you'll get to hear this. Jeff Seuss was awesome enough to bring this to my house. Stopped by him and his wife Sheila. Nice week. We were good. We were far apart. He dropped this at the doorstep and backed off and we chatted for a bit. Jeff's got us a copy of For the Queen, which is awesome. Mm. And even cooler than that, Jeff managed to get Alex Roberts themselves to sign nice. one of the cards in here, which that is so awesome, Jeff. It just, I, I was, I don't know, I'm, I'm broken up about it. Thank you very much, Jeff and Sheila. Awesome. Always appreciated. Um, <laughs> People like I think I heard the bells because they're so used to hearing them. I know, I know. It's, it is, but things have been changing, and I've been had some audio issues prior to the show tonight. So I just wanted to make sure that it was one thing that I I could deal with, and and not something that I was going to have to hate myself yeah. for later. This is, um, this is the thing we're improving things, but by improving things, we change things, and as soon as we change things, change is things, evil. Ch- change is bad. You should have seen earlier today. We were, I had a, I, a, our people who are, get my newsletter, the people who get the Tabletop Bellhop Weekly newsletter, know about this one. Um, we were trying to run with a camcorder instead of this webcam, which in some ways was better and worse. For one, my video was like way shorter and you'd just see my head. Like I'd be like right here. Yeah. That's it. There's my head. Uh, so it didn't quite work, but the quality was so much better. Like I, you could read the covers of the white dwarves behind me. So we were trying to get it to work. It might be a possible thing because we might have to um, slide the table this way because right now it's up against a wall and then put the camera farther back. But like trying to get that set up because like, zoom didn't recognize it and well then i got zoom to recognize it but it was squished because for some reason the default settings 540 instead of 1080 which makes no sense even though i'm on the setting of 1080p and it was a mess yep. so yeah it's been all kinds of tech issues and then of course when i tried to go live tonight we were a little late we were about five minutes late tonight and it's because that webcam wasn't being recognized by zoom anymore because it wanted to get because what we did is we put patched it through Streamlabs so i could stretch the video before it went to zoom oh, i was This is probably more coffee break talk at this point, (laughs) but it was a bit of a mess. And by messing with things, we, of course, messed up when things go live. All right, but we're continuing on now. We're here to answer your game, gaming, and game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or go over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. A social media works too, where everywhere is tabletop bellhop, one word. Now, the best way is for questions to go through the website. That way they get logged, they get notifications. They actually go to two places, they go to the blog and my inbox. So I'm not going to miss them, um, but I'm up for questions asked anywhere. Just hit me up if you see me online. Well, last week we had someone, Dan, looking for games that seemed much heavier than they actually are. Mm-hmm. Games that are intimidating and easily scare off players, but are actually easier to play or learn than they seem. This week, we're going to look at that question a bit more philosophically. Yeah, we're working on the show notes for last week. I actually started 
working on a discussion about what some games and designers do that make these heavier games easier to learn and play. And I had thought that we'd start off last week's episode by having that discussion, having a whole talk about what people can do to make the games more approachable and easier to learn. Then our moderator in chief and grammatical goddess Deanna and she games stepped in. Yeah. Deanna pointed out that starting off the conversation talking like that, we were going to run into a time problem that by the time we talk about making games easier, we wouldn't actually have time left to suggest any games for Dan, which is totally true, uh, especially based on our last game recommendation episode where we went over two hours just because we recommended so many games. Now, the thing is, I still wanted to have that conversation. Like this is, I personally think this is fascinating, the, what you can do to make games more approachable and easier. Now we're not thinking about accessible, approachable, two different things. And I think it's good content that I think, like if I'm interested, I'm assuming here that if I'm interested, someone out there also would be interested. I think it's cool content. And it's not something I've heard other people talk about before. So it's not something like everyone's talking about this. There's a lot of information on it. So I thought it would be something interesting for us to cover. So here we are this week talking about things that designers can do to make their games easier to play and learn. Ways to produce games that are simpler than they might first appear. Now, again, going back to last week, we did talk about this a bit as a, as we were going through the games, right? As we went through each of the 12 games in the list and the three honorable mentions, I did mention a bit about what elements of those games made them easier than expected, except Zolkin, which I still haven't quite figured out. Today, though, what we're going to do is take those elements, break them down a bit more, talk about them. Plus, I'm pretty sure we've got some today that didn't come up at all last week. Well, plus, with our great chat room here, hopefully anything that might slip by us will get picked up in the lobby. Yeah, we'll be checking back at the end of the discussion to see if they have anything to add. we got a ton of fine folks joining us tonight. I'm sure someone will have a great idea. So the first thing to me that makes or breaks a game in a way is a good rule book. One of the best things any game designer or publisher can do to make their games easier to learn is provide a good set of rules. A good rule book should not only be great at explaining how to play the game, but also be a piece of reference material that you can come back to. There should be lots of images showing actual gameplay and game components. And I do this in all of my unboxings. I always say with actual game components, because I've seen books that don't do that, that they use like icons or something and they don't actually show the bits in the game. There should be lots of these images and examples. Examples should be huge. There should be an example. If you have five actions, have an example of all five actions. There should be an index, some way to, to find the information in this book once you've gone through it. Reading it cover to cover is one thing, but when you're in the middle of a game, you need to find that one rule. You shouldn't have to flip through the entire book. And then um, summaries. Uh, whether that's an appendix or something on the back of the book, you want your round structure, your turn structure, your whole top to bottom, here's your game summarized in one page, should be there in one page, usually on the back of the book. And then any little fiddly microsystems, right? Little, whatever needs it. So like combat steps or an action flow chart or a tech tree or something like that. Any detailed step-by-step -step process that players have to go through and iterate through should be summarized somewhere in that book in an easy to find place. This is really where it all starts. Clarity, detail, and let's not forget readability. Glossaries of play terms, and you can always start mm -hmm. a fact right there in the book if mm -hmm. questions came up during play testing that didn't seem to fit well in the rules or needed a little extra clarification. Uh, the DC deck builder is good for this. They they have some some call outs in the back of the book that are just clarity. So it's, mm -hmm. you know, when cards interactions could be confusing, there's an extra bit in the back of the guide about those. Yeah, I, I'm trying to think of which company does it, but there's one company that the last section of every book is frequently um, missed rules or frequently misplayed rules. And I love that, that little boom, here's a little, hey, here's the stuff people tend to forget. Yep. Up next, and this kind of goes with the rule book to me. To me, this is as important. Our reference materials separate from the rule book, uh, quick start guides, um, quick setup rules on a separate sheet, um, a picture of 
the board should be laid at the beginning of the game. A turn summary, the player summary, where there's a card for all the players that explains the turns or the possible actions. Um, your tech tree printed out big. End game scoring reminders. Um, the list of upgrade costs, like how much it costs to build your various things in the game. Again, this is all very game dependent. This is all the extra bits, the cards, reference sheets, summaries, foldouts, triptychs, whatever they happen to be. All the stuff that saves players from having to look up things in the big thick rule book. These not only serve as useful reference, but these are also great reminders of things that are easily forgotten. By having a card that shows the end game scoring in front of you for the whole game, you're not gonna forget that one obscure thing that only matters at the end of the game that the teacher only taught you at the beginning of the rule book. By having it out in front of you, every time you look down at your player tableau, you're like, oh, that's right. At the end of the game, money is actually worth points. So I wanna make sure I have some left as a <laughs> very vague example. Yeah, we shouldn't have to rely on third-party websites for summary and reference cards. The designers and publishers should know if a game is complex enough to require such details to make it easier to play. And I still say no game is simple enough to not have something. Just that one card that shows you the turn order. Like, unless you're already down to a one-page rulebook, just a one card, even roll for lasers could have used like a little card that just showed the icons. Just, just a little basic thing, right? And it's not a high cost item to throw in there. I love player reference material. Absolutely. Next is clarity of design. This actually covers a lot of things. Um, we're going to break this down a bit further than the last couple topics. Um, starting with the graphic design of things, we are talking about every aspect of design from layout to the board to the font everything that can be done to affect the the ui of the game the user experience um the user interface a lot can be done with graphic design to make games easier to play and i have since learned this is a new discovery for me is eno tool is the master you know tool works with vital Lacerda to make some of the heaviest board games on the planet and ian's design philosophy as a graphic designer as an artist is to make the game easier to play through the artwork and through the design which is brilliant uh things like what goes in a player's area like in your tableau versus what's on the board what information should be on the board to act as reminders like remember that end game scoring i was just talking about maybe instead of a card it's on the board so everyone can see it but then by putting it on the board it only faces one player so it better be something that can be recognized from all four directions if it can't then you put it on a card those kind of decisions um, for another example is resources. If you are playing a game where everyone has to know how much of everything everyone has, instead of having piles of stuff in front of you where you have to be like, how many do you have? How many do you have? Instead, put a track on the board that everyone can quickly look and see where it's at. Those are examples of things I know Ian O'Toole's done and other designers. I'm just giving Ian credit for being the master of this. There are every board game designer should be taking this into account. Another big topic when we're talking about design is typefaces. Please think about these details like serif or sans, kerning, sizing. As we learned from the Orleans expansion, think about the future. Maybe it isn't vital initially that your city names are readable easily from across the table, but mm -hmm. if you're going to expand later, it becomes vital. Think ahead. Clarity should also take into account the expected distance to the player. Mm -hmm. Something in your hand on a card can be smaller or fancier than something over on the board, which might be at arm's length or further from the player. Yeah. And talking about distance from player actually leads into our next topic of design, which is something that was proposed by Professor Scott Rogers, who is uh, very well known. He was originally youtube personality one of the first board game youtube personalities uh who now teaches board game design up here in canada who proposed what he calls the zones of play and his original theory has six zones of play some people have theorized more um which are the player's dominant hand which for me is my right but it's dominant it's right or left the player's non-dominant hand the tableau in front of the player the board or the shared Spain place, because not everywhere has a board, the sideboard, so the stuff that's off the side of the rules, and then the rule book. 
which is interesting because he also includes the internet with the rule book. So any other rule reference. Now, a lot of other people have pointed out the seventh spot being the box for being stuff you're not going to use, which I actually really like the idea of inclusion of the seventh. If there's something that doesn't matter in this game, but still is important to the game overall, like if you keep six out of seven and you put the seventh in the box, I perfect. I personally think Scott should add that as a seven. But his original idea is six. And like, I, I don't want to get into too much detail here because I honestly think we could do an entire episode on the six zones of play. I don't know if we have to, because if you listen to the Ludology podcast, just look up Ludology six zones of play and listen to that because they're going to do a way better job than Sean and I could. Um, what I would do, Stu, is what matters is to take these into consideration. So the most important thing to a player on your turn, on their turn, should be in their hand, in their dominant hand, if it's private information, or if everyone has to know what it should be in their table tableau, it shouldn't be over on a board. It shouldn't be on a sidebar. It definitely shouldn't be in the rule book. <laughs> so that's just a quick little summary about it. And this is something that I think is very important for designers to start thinking about. Now it's something that's always existed, but just Scott's done a good uh, job codifying it and breaking it down. That gives you a, a, a way to talk about it too. It's a, it's a good thing for a conversation between designers and and the publishers and the graphic artists and all yeah. of that. Think of it as a scale. So seven is the furthest thing from you or six is the furthest thing from you. Whereas one is up close. Uh, mm. The more important uh, items should be in those one to three and the less important or, or less often referenced in the four to six. Yep. It gives me flashbacks. I got to admit from uh, working in the automotive industry and Kanban and lean manufacturing and five S like as soon as I saw this, I'm like, 5S your game. <laughs> you want the stuff you always use to be right here so you can reach it all the time. And the stuff you almost never touch should be over there. And the stuff you need once a month in a cabinet down in, you know, the maintenance area. Same idea, but applied to board games. All right, next is an element of design, and that is iconography. Um, this, to me, can make or break a game. Like, icons need to be easy to read, easy to see. Most importantly, easy to differentiate from each other. And some games fail on that part. And then the icon should actually relate to what you do, like what they represent, which I, I have seen. Why is this an arrow when you're not moving or passing or going? Don't use an arrow unless there's some kind of motion involved. Um, Race for the Galaxy is a game that I personally think does this totally wrong. There are too many icons that are too similar to each other and it's overwhelming and where the icons are matters as well as what the icons are. It's terrible. That's why that game, that's the opposite of what we talked about last week. That is a game that is more complicated than it looks like because of the iconography. Whereas Vinhos is really good at this one where everything on the board just makes sense. Like what's, why is there a cube there? Oh, that's a reminder that you have to place a cube. Well, of course, cause it's a cube and it has a down arrow, which generally means put it down. And it means place a cube here. Wow, there's a down arrow with a cube next to this action. Probably means that when I take this action, I have to put a cube there. And like, it's that simple. You almost don't have to teach parts of the rules because the iconography is so clear. Again, thanks Eno Tool for that one. This is the the Eno Tool love fest tonight. <laughs> Unintentional, actually. You know, I, people people can take a lesson from IKEA on this one. There's a reason yeah. why they don't need words in their ma manuals because mm -hmm. they just explain it visually for everyone so that they don't have to worry about translations. Yeah, very and true. This is another area where it helps if you can see the future. If yeah. you are planning expansions or even considering expanding your game in the future. Think about how you might be able to continue your design in a natural manner, which mm -hmm. remains consistent so that when you release expansion box four, you don't suddenly have a completely different type of symbols that don't match the rest of the feel of the game because you ran out of whatever you were doing before. Yeah. And on, in an, on an opposite way, what's funny is I've seen this not, not work badly, but I find the Marvel Legendary series. They came up with symbols for the one game but then when you're playing some of the other games, they seem odd. You're like, what the heck is this fist supposed to mean? Well, well, that's just the symbol they've used in all their sets as an, yeah. as an example of it. Um, and as another example of actually planning ahead is Core World. So when Core Worlds from Stronghold Games came out, there was a spot on every card that had an icon. And the rule book literally said, these icons are for a later expansion. And they, they had planned it out, expecting to use these icons. And again, these were nice, really clear. They're, they were basically the same idea as the ship colors in Star Realms. It was, it was a concept like that, but that wasn't introduced in the core game. Right. All right. 
Sticking with design, but moving away from graphical, going into the physical realm, uh, that is component design. And this is one that I think people don't realize. And this one's very subtle. Like I think a lot of publishers are doing this and people don't necessarily realize they're doing it. And it's great that they're doing it or they're not thinking about it at all. And what this is, is you can do things with the physical components to make the game easier to learn. And the biggest thing here is theming the elements so that different components used for different parts of the game are physically different somehow. Uh, early games were terrible at this, especially Euro games. Early Mayfair, Rio Grande, Aaliyah games, I'm looking at all of you, everything was a cube or a meeple. It didn't matter if it was a resource spent, if it was a currency, if it was a representation of a penalty you took at the end of the game. It was all just different colored cubes. And yes, okay, the bad ones were, were whatever. The good ones were green and the bad ones were red, but that's about it. And that's how you could tell them apart. Um, for a great modern example of this is Raiders of the North Sea. Like this is the game I noticed it and went, wow. And then I started looking at my other games to see if other games were doing it because Everything, you're a Viking Raider. Everything you raid in that game is wood. It's all wooden components and they all look unique, but everything you raid is wood. So you're like, okay, all the wood stuff's raiding. The money you have to spend are metal coins. So it's a completely different texture. It feels different. You use it for something different. You need plunder to go raiding. Now you don't get plunder for raiding. So it's not wood. It's not a currency. So you don't spend it. So it's not metal. Instead, those are cardboard. They're just cardboard chips because those get passed back and forth a lot. You're going to hand those all over the place. They're light. They're easy to handle. So you're, you get uh, thin cardboard for those. Then anytime you collect something for the end of the game in that, and you're going to score at the end of the game, it's a cardboard tile. And it's one that you might not even realize when you're playing, but whenever you trade in, um, trade in your resources to improve and impress the chieftain, you take a tile. When you add in the expansion, when you complete a quest, you take a tile. All of the tiles are end game scoring. Like that's brilliant, the way they divided that up. I think that like, I wanna see more games do it. And as I look at the games I own, I do see some games doing it. Like for example, another good example is Gold West, where you have cubes for your two resources you use to build settlements and then metals, which are different shaped hexagons, well not hexagons, whatever. I, round circles with multiple different sides. One of them is a hexagon and then there's, I don't know, an octagon and a something else. And they're def differentiated, but like the metals are a different size, shape and texture than the resources used to build cities. And of course, with uh, Ryan and the Daniels regularly in our lobby, we can't forget to yes. mention about both color and legally blind players. Making the game easier to play means making it easier for everyone to learn and play, not just some players. Yes. All right. Next, this is something that's very modern, something we didn't have back in the day, is online support. Once a game's published and out in the wild, you're going to find out there's something wrong with the game. It's, it's pretty much inevitable. Like, no one releases a perfect game. If it's happened, uh, congratulations, whoever demands to do it. There's going to be mistakes in the rule book. There's going to be a missed rule. There's going to be an ambiguous situation or balance issues or anything else. Anything that generally gets thrown all together in an errata. All of this should be fixed. No game should just be left out there to live or die in its own merits. There should be a living PDF version of every board game rule book ever made, in my opinion. It, there should be a place to find the FAQ. This should be on your company's website and should be on Board Game Geek because those are the two places every gamer in the know is going to go and a gamer not in the know is going to at least check the company website. I would go so far as to suggest having a QR code in your rule book leading to where to find this information. Even if you don't have any yet, like when you release this game, make an FAQ page, put a QR code in your rule book. And when people scan it, if there's nothing to see here, say, hey, we got it right. There's nothing wrong. If you've noticed a problem with our game, contact us here. And then when inevitably you do find problems with the games, you fill that page up. Now, again, jumping back to the zones we were talking about, Scott Rogers considers this part of zone six. This is part of your play space in modern gaming. I Every game I play, at some point, I grab my phone and Google something, and 99% of the time, I'm going to Board Game Geek to find the answer. Like, like games we have played hundreds of times, just that one situation comes up, we're like, oh man, I don't know, is it this or this? And I, I expect to find an answer nowadays. Yeah, and at the very least, as we've discussed previously, put it on Board Game Geek. 
it's almost a sure thing that Board Game Geek is going to rank higher in Google than many <laughs> publishers. So True. use their forums, their file space to host your FAQs and living rule books. It's a good chance that gamers will find it there first, even if it is on your own website. I mean, you can if it is on your website, great. Go to Board Game yeah. Geek and put a link to your own website. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just want to shout out today to uh, Cool Mini or Not, Simon, or whatever you want to call them. Uh, even just today, they published a giant FAQ for Cthulhu Death May Die that yep. answered a whole bunch of things and really broke down things really nicely, as well as being an FAQ. It was a full uh, walkthrough nice. of, of information. Uh, and so they are still supporting that, and they've got it right there on the, on their, the product page mm -hmm. for Death May Die. Now, what I'd also appreciate, and I realize this is a cost issue, is I would love to see that information end up in the next printing of the games. Like that, that's a please if you can. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean reprint your whole rule book. Maybe it's just you get the manufacturer to throw in a little one sheet. That one sheet could even say, see our FAQ here, or have the actual rules on it. Back in the day, I remember every time you bought an expansion for a game, you found out what you were doing wrong in the base game. Like I would get a new Talisman expansion, Talisman the Dragon, and I'd open it up and there'd be an FAQ and I'd be like, oh, I've been playing Talisman wrong for two years. <laughs> Interesting to know. Like it shouldn't have to wait for an expansion. But if you are publishing expansion, again, toss that info in there. If there's a problem, um, we reviewed Eminent Domain last week. Eminent Domain's fantastic for that. Every Eminent Domain book has a rule clarification from the original rule book. And it's the same rule they keep clarifying, but it's an important rule to clarify. I would love to see that. Again, just keeping a up-to-date version somewhere online I can find will still make me happy. That next step would be great. All right. Also, sticking with online in today's internet world, I personally think every game nowadays should have a video tutorial. This goes back to, I think, the third thing we ever talked about on, like, I think it's episode three. I may have it off, which was teaching games. And we talked about how people learn and how when teaching games, you should try to present the information in multiple different ways because some people are going to learn better by watching or hearing over reading. And I expect nowadays to have both options available. I should be able to go somewhere and put on a video and either watch it listen to it both or read the rule book i should have that variety should be available now thankfully more and more publishers are jumping on board with this it is becoming more and more common there are some very well known uh video tutorials teachers i don't know what you call them youtube stars i guess whatever content creators who specialize on making actual play videos and what's awesome is that companies are now hiring these people which is great to see that's great for them we've done a couple how to plays we're nowhere near good enough we don't need a publisher to pay us to do this we're, we're we'd, have, we'd have to up our production and, and professionalism quite a bit but even if a publisher's not doing it someone out there is going to do it they like unless the game's from 1987 and hasn't been republished for years, even then there's probably someone who's done a video on how to play it nowadays. Like it's very seldom you can't find one. So as my own experience has taught me learning games with, with YouTube, the quality of those self-made video tutorials varies wildly from our mm. less than ideal uh, things to some really professional stuff like mm. done by, by gaming rules and, and some of the other uh, content creators out there. I keep finding more of them all the time. Uh, if you merely trust the internet to do it for you as a publisher, you're giving up control just mm -hmm. as much as if you let someone who bought the game write your rule book for you. Yeah, in a way that's true. And plus, you're not trusting someone else to teach your game even, right? Like you're, 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 you're putting an awful lot of trust in your rule book, the person who's reading that rule book and their ability to teach other people how to play. Because I don't know any group where all the players about to play a game read the rule book ahead of time. Like that's just not something that happens. Maybe back in the day, that was a thing where everyone would read the rules before like, I've tried it. I'm like, hey, we're gonna play this Sunday and I'll send the PDF of the rules to everyone. Two out of five people will have actually read it. It just, it doesn't happen. It's not something you can expect. I send five people a link to a 20 minute YouTube video. You will guarantee probably four of those five people will have watched it before showing up. It's just, and the control as Sean mentioned is a huge part of it. All right, so that's some of the physical things that you can improve on um, to help learning and playability in games. But let's 
dive into some mechanical things you can do things you can do in the mechanics of the game not timographic design or component quality or the rule book but things you can actually do in the core loop of the game to make them better and the biggest one to hear this is the one that last week out of 15 games i think we talked about it on 12 of them is to limit player options this is the biggest thing a designer can do to make heavy games more approachable one of the things that affects weight in games which if you want to know more about weight in games we got a whole podcast about that too and blog post is the decision tree the number of the number of branches on the decision tree the number of options a player is presented to at one time is one of the biggest factors in game weight by limiting that you make the game easier this is the whole how do you eat an elephant right the the old adage you eat it one bite at a time by presenting players with only a limited number of options at the start of the game and slowly adding new options as the game goes on, you can make the most complex game start off simple and build at a rate that players are going to be comfortable with. So take the video game industry as a shining example of this. Not of many things, but of this. <laughs> Onboarding in stages is just the way to go. How you go about it will largely depend on your game and many factors about how it's played. But knowing that you should take the time to onboard players in a gradual manner is a vital piece of the puzzle. Yeah. Now, this is a big one, right? So what I want to do is break down a bit on what you can do to limit player options so that mechanically, depending on what kind of game you're playing. So the biggest place you're going to see this when it kind of smacks you in the face is any worker placement or action selection game where not all of those spots or all those actions are available at the start. Now I've seen this done by only having a set number of options even out there. So you only have whatever the starting board, uh, an example of that is Agricola where you only have so many actions. And then as the game goes on, you're going to add more. Another way is to add cost to the actions that the players won't be able to afford at the start of the game. So here's all 10 things you can do, but on turn one, you're going to be able to afford these three. I would say not having them out is better because when all 10 are out, you kind of have to explain all 10 of them and that can overwhelm someone. But uh, both ways are better than going, here's all 10 options, pick, it's your first turn, go. Yeah, you can afford to do any of them. Now, another way of doing this is limiting resources. This is similar to the whole you can only afford to do the first three, but if you can only afford to buy a limited number of things, it's the same thing as having a limited number of actions. And whether your resource is action point or money to spend or whatever it is, there's no point looking at that super galactic star freighter with the extra guns on it when all you've got is two mega credits to be able and all you can buy is maybe a basic engine. It's just, it's the same situation as the last one just created in a different way. Similar to limiting the start of options at the start of the game, many games instead do it the other way around where they add content as you play. Now, I'm not just talking about action spots. I'm talking about content. Like this is looking way beyond just action point systems. I am talking about totally unlocking new content as you get further in the game. This is a great way to build on the weight and complexity. The main place you see this, of course, are campaign games where when you finish scenario one, you go to scenario two and scenario two has something else. Um, a great example of this that really breaks it up and throws it in your face is the Harry Potter Hogwarts battle deck building game. Cause you play through books one at a time. And when you finish one book, you open a box for book two and get new stuff. And another very recent example, the new hotness right now would be Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion and the way the first five intro scenarios work. Now, once you get past those, goodbye onboarding, but that first five scenarios in that, do that whole, all right, here's the basics. Okay, here's the basics plus a bit more. All right, now let's give you a little bit more. Okay, now we're going to try this, and then, all right, here you go. Let's see how you do with the full rules. Yeah, and it's especially nice to note that Hogwarts Battle even has a skip function. So if you're with a bunch of advanced deck-building players, you can jump right to that fourth mm. step and get into the game with a lot more meat to it. But if you're teaching it to your family or to non-experienced deck-builder players... You start at one and you work your way all the way through and the beginners are brought up to speed uh, nice and easy. Yep. And Jaws of the Lion actually does the, the same thing. And uh, someone actually pointed that out that we didn't cover that when we were comparing the two games is that um, Isaac suggests the experienced players start again four. I don't know if four is the magic number. Start on scenario four instead of starting at scenario one. Uh, 
like personally, I don't know. Like, like Deanna and I were experienced players. I took the time to go through the earlier ones. Like they're simple, quick. We pounded through three in one night, but I could see the appeal where some people might want to just skip the intro stuff and dive into the almost full game. It's it's scenario four is when you start using the full monster decks and when you start getting XP in and the elements are there. So like pretty much all the full rules for Gloomhaven are there. Now, speaking of Jaws of Lion, um, those, those first five scenarios are what you would call a tutorial. And tutorials are something fantastic for making your games easier to understand. I love it when a heavy game includes some form of tutorial that slowly introduces players to the game. Now, again, Jaws does the five starters, but another example of this is Mage Knight, the board game. This is one of the longest, most extensive tutorials I've ever seen, but it breaks the game down in such a way that it takes one of the heavier games ever published and makes it seem almost simple by the time you're done, if you follow through that steps. Um, sometimes this is explicit, right? Like the tutorial is like, hey, it's a tutorial. But other times they don't announce it, right? It's just part of the design. So an example, Sean earlier was talking about Cthulhu Death May Die. Well, they did it in Cthulhu Death May Die by making scenario one rather basic. Scenario two, all of a sudden you have to worry about carrying around items and dealing with one extra monster type. And then scenario three adds on another thing. And there's nowhere in the book that says scenario one's a tutorial, but it just, it creates a tutorial by ramping up the difficulty of each scenario. Now, just be mindful as you're designing these things about the balance between guiding and handholding. You don't want to talk down to your players. Mm. Now, simpler, similar to tutorials, you have simpler modes of play. This is this is something separate. So this would be like the family version or the beginner version or the first time you play. Uh, Settlers of Catan is one that has this that a lot of people don't realize because they've learned Catan from other people, but there is actually a recommended board layout and starting position for all player counts so that everyone is is that's new to the game doesn't have to do the hard decision because the first thing you do when you play Settlers of Catan is place your settlement. And if you don't know the game, how do you know where to place it? So this takes away that decision point. Agricola, we mentioned earlier, has a family mode where you don't use the cards. Pulsar 2849 has a mode where you don't use the individual player boards, the player HQs. This is a great way to teach the core concept of a game and the core mechanics and make sure players fully grasp the important parts before giving all that, the, the shine, the sparkle. Yeah, when, it, when we taught Pulsar, you guys just threw me in the deep end uh, with that with the player cards. Although I think discussing, I think after discussing it, we did a a rough, like, let's try the first two turns to learn. Okay. And then, okay, you know what you're doing? All right, let's throw the player boards in too because you're feeling comfortable. All right, yeah, because I'm like, I swear I taught the game without them. <laughs> Yeah. And then we played with them. But so. I think, but I think, and we've talked about this when it comes to Pulsar 2849 is get in there and, and play those first couple of rounds to figure out how the dice bidding mm -hmm. works and things. All right. Taking the beginner or family mode to the next level. Some games actually have simpler versions of themselves that are games on their own. Um, I, I don't always, can't always recommend these because they're not always a logical progression. Like Jaws of the Lion is a perfect one. It is a simplified version of Gloomhaven that is a great stepping stone into it. There are others. The Ticket to Ride City series of uh, New York, London, and I think Amsterdam's coming soon are really simpler Ticket to Ride games. Um, then stepping down even further, there's the Ticket to Ride First Journey. Uh, another example is King Domino versus Queen Domino. And now there's even a kid's King Domino that I just learned about called Dragon Domino that's an intro. But again, you got to kind of watch these because some of them aren't the same game. Like my first Carcassonne has tiles and meeples, but that's it. Like it's not Kark. It's not going to help you learn Kark. It's a great game my kids can play with tiles and meeples that kind of looks like Carcassonne, but it's not actually a stepping stone. If you ever do want to know if a game's related to each other, you can find that information out on Board Game Geek or you can ask experts like us. Yeah, so just... Don't necessarily go out and pick up Catan Jr. to learn Catan, but if you're teaching to children, that may be appropriate. Yeah. So, Yeah, Catan Jr. is kind of a step. It gets you the resource management and the rolling for resources, but yeah, it's, it's a little too simple in a way. Now, another thing that can be done to make games less complicated is to share that complexity with everyone else. Split the cognitive load between the players by making the game cooperative or by having a cooperative mode in the game. A great example of this recent example is Vitalis Urtis CO2. 
this is a media euro about environmentalism and power plants and getting rid of um, polluting fuels and replacing with green energy. And it was a cutthroat, rather hard to learn game. They recently published the second edition of this and they swapped the game to be cooperative at its start, like basically cooperative with a variant for competitive. And the great part about cooperative games is when you have players at different experience levels, because this is where the experienced player can help the less experienced players and not just like dominate them in a player versus player game where the experienced player is like, ah, I know what I'm doing and I'm going to kick your butts. Instead, they get to help and work with everyone else. So, of course, as ever, we do often call out the risks of quarterbacking. Mm. So you just need to be aware that even if you're, you know, you can dominate in a co-op game too. So uh, just be aware that you, you should be teaching, not, uh, you know, co not running the game for them. Yes. People still should get to make their own decisions. Another example of a game that's now made cooperative that was competitive is Star Wars Imperial Assault. With the app, it is now a co-op game. Which leads me to the next way to make a complicated game less complicated. Throw in an app. This is going to become more and more common, I think, as times go on. This includes ones like Imperial Assault that basically takes over the role of the, the DM, the dark side player, but also includes helper apps. Uh, the one we use the most often is the awesome Gloomhaven helper app that manages the bad guys, conditions, uh, health, money, tracks XP. Like, it takes all of that. And removes that element of Gloomhaven so you can focus on playing your cards and beating the scenario. And technically it works for Jaws of the Lion as well. So as court, you do need to remember that if you're leaning heavily on an app as a publisher, you need to support that app for as long as you want your game to be available, mm -hmm. played and learned in the cases of the Gloomhaven app, it's actually a third party app. So it could go away at any time yeah. because it's not actually related to the game directly. Yeah, though I know Isaac has endorsed that app many times. I don't I'm hoping he kind of gave him some money or something. Like that is such a good app. All right, final one. It's been a fairly long topic. This is this is an interesting one that's a little hard to describe. This is tying the theme of the game to the mechanics. And I know we get called out, or at least I get called out all the time for skipping over to the theme, but you know what? Theme can matter. And where this matters the most is I find when the mechanics of the game are actually tied to the theme tightly, like they make logical sense, the players are going to remember those mechanics because they just make sense in the game world. Uh, again, I'm going to bring up Vinhost Deluxe, not just because I've been recently playing it, but it's a great example of a game where the mechanics in the game just make sense. Like you have wine experts. Well, why would you buy a wine expert? Well, they're going to give you a bonus and give you something you can do. Okay. That part makes sense. But also you're going to go to a tasting party. You're going to go to a wine festival. And if you have the right expert with you, your wine's going to score better. Well, it just makes sense. If I'm going to a con, I bring my expert with me to sell my wines. Like it, it makes sense. Or the fact that when I buy a cellar and put it into a vineyard in the region of Lisboa, the reputation of Lisboa goes up. And that's actually represented the game. That's the put the cube thing I was talking about earlier, actually, is there's a little symbol next to pushing a cellar that shows a cube symbol, which means wherever you put the cellar, put down a reputation cube. Just little things like that. And there's more to it. Like the way your wine ages, it moves to the right every year and it becomes worth more and you move it on your cellar. Like almost every mechanic in that game, except for the very basic worker placement, how to choose your action is tied to the theme in some way. And that makes what is really a heavy game just makes sense when you're playing it. It's just like, well, wait, air is another example. What does buying a seller do? Well, it makes your wine's value go up. Well, duh. <laughs> right. uh, and, and in a game like Pulsar, uh, it's really about removing those abstract ideas. Moving a meeple on a grid won't have the same mental connection for a player as moving a little spaceship hmm. on, along, on a path between drawn out stars on a galaxy. And I think for me, that's really what separates experiences with a game like Pulsar, which I is a meaty game that I was drawn to immediately versus a game like Lords of Waterdeep, which people love and isn't all that difficult. And it had all the text and the art to, to be D&D, &D, mm -hmm. but it really just felt like an abstract worker placement with a very pretty D&D &D paint job on it. No, it's a perfect sense in Lords of Waterdeep why do I need three fighters, a wizard, and six thieves, and $7 to domesticate owlbears? Like, yeah. why? 
<laughs> there's there's no tie in there like yeah. it's it's got a neat theme and i find the game more fun when i talk about the fact that i domesticated owl bears but honestly yeah. or why when i go to the print shop do i get a dollar and someone else gets two like it just it's it's all just mechanics with a paste on theme well there you have some things that can be done to make board games easier to learn and play let's head mm -hmm. over to the lobby and we'll see if anyone in our chat room has had anything to add uh, I see uh, Ryan talking about uh, some great things. He joined us a little later, but uh, he notes that most digital rule books and video tutorials leave out information that makes learning game from it difficult for non-visual players. Yeah, the pro this is it, this is where you you need the ones produced by the publisher or by by uh, like Rodney Smith. Watch it played. You got Rado runs through Rado for non-visual players would be bad because Rado makes mistakes. And Rado corrects them in the Klingon subtitles, but that doesn't help someone who can't see. So Rado does fall down on that aspect of it. Or Gaming Rules, uh, Paul Grogan. I, gaming Rules, I personally find is the most thorough. Whereas uh, Rodney, I find great, but Rodney has a habit of using the term, I'll leave that for you to discover on your own. And that's a, it's a rather famous term of Rodney's. And I like it. I, it amuses me. But there, if you're learning the game, and you're doing it because you can't read, how do you discover that on your own, right? Like, you're, it'd be nice if, if Rodney added a separate video of those things that you should click my other video to discover them with me or discover them on your own would be a, nice, a next step for, for people right. with, with vision and hearing problems. Jumping back a little ways, uh, when we were talking about iconography, uh, apparently you and D were trying to remember a game and Bastille yes. was that game. Oh, yes. Yeah, I, I came up with Vinhos because I just played Vinhos, so it was fresh in my mind. It is a good example, but Bastille blows it away. Bastille's iconography and board design is fantastic. The only thing that I think could have been done better is it's very, everyone's looking at the board this way centric. And, and I don't know if they could have made it so the city was round, so things were facing different players. But other than that aspect, like the flow f makes sense. And the icons, like you just said, how many crowns do you have? I can just do this and kind of look and see how many crowns people have. And and again, why do I want crowns? Well, there's a huge thing on the side of the board that shows you what crowns are for. And then there's a scoring track. And oh, it, it is a fantastic game for iconography. That is still like uh, Travis from Queen Games told me this was a hidden gem and, and people, it hasn't gotten enough hype. And I totally agree. And that took a few plays. I'll admit the first time I played it, I was like, eh, about this game uh it wasn't a complaint of the iconography of the design there's just some weird things with collecting people that you need to kind of understand how it works before you play uh it, it wouldn't have been on our easy to learn games though the iconography does make that game easier to learn than it seems i will admit it's but there are other aspects of the game that i don't think make it an easier than expected game uh jeff uh, seuss um pointed out uh, a great question on the topic of player of rule summary cards. How do you get players to clue in that this rule summary you've given them is really important and to actually look at it? I accept saying that. Yeah. I, I don't know. Um, I, I think that's a player experience thing. I, I, this is, so this is it. If those became more common, if more people use them and if every game had them, then people would use them more, right? They'd be like, oh yeah, this is obviously my card that's going to remind me of my things to do. And if every game had them, then people would be more accepting of them. Where if it's the thing you only see once every six games, you're just like, what's this a card? Oh, a summary? Well, you just told me everything. I don't need that. Plus the information has to be useful. So that's another aspect of it is put something on there that they do have to reference that makes them look at it in a way. So like if at the end of the round, you need to calculate how much grain you generate and you put that graph on the card, then they're going to be looking at the card. And then under that, it's the end game scoring reminder. So like, okay, I'm calculating my grain. Oh, that's right. I want to also remember I need cows. And again, I'm not referencing any particular game here. I'm just coming up with. And I think what, it, what, because games aren't doing this often enough, what might be a good idea is bring this to your table. So your yeah. personal table at home Start getting reference cards, whether you make your own or you download them from a third party, but make that reference card uh, use a, a regular thing at your table so that your players know to expect it and understand that it has value and can speed the game along. Um, 
Anything else? From uh, Stonemeyer Pennywise notes is good about colorblind friendly games uh, awesome. using a number of different apps to see how uh, how things. Yeah, look we brought those up before in, in previous episodes. We've talked about them. There are there are two or three or four. Like there's some websites where you can basically. Yeah. Uh, upload your image and it'll show it to you in various different things. Yeah, the one I found was... good. Now, does Stonemeyer also do the feel different? Because that's that next level, right? So I, I talked about Gold West earlier in the show. And one of the things Gold West did, and what's odd is they did it for the metals, not the, the wood or the stone, is the silver, the gold, and the copper have a different number of sides on the cylinders. So you can, by touch, tell them apart. Besides the fact that they're also painted metallic. And colorblind friendly versus not is great for this. And another one was, was it Endeavor? I think was another one where they had done the different shapes of everything so that every resource was, was tactically different. Clans of Caledonia is a perfect example of that. Every single one of the resources, like back in the day, those would have been cubes. Every single, they would have been different color cubes. Yep. Cows would have been one cube, color cube. And, and I don't know, they would have done something. Red totally cows, different. white sheep. And you know, yeah, <laughs> it, wool would have been gray. Yep. And wood would have been Brown. There's no wood. Cheese would have been yellow. The fact that that game has a different shaped resource for everything is great. And then they have flat versions of those that are your actual resources you collect. So your production buildings are in your player color, are each uniquely shaped. And then the resources you gather are flat wood. And like, so you have, again, the difference of, well, this shape sheep obviously is a production building because it looks like a little meeple sheep. And this wool is a round thing that's flat. So it's obviously a resource. Like that is something I think is next level stuff that I would love. I love seeing more and more of. Now, of course, you get into the, what's becoming more and more common are the 3D, like the fully, whether 3D printed or sculpted or resin or whatever, like Scythe is is one of those games that, that people upgrade their game of Scythe for all different, um, for all the different resources. So instead of having like little wooden things, you have things that like look more like real things. And uh, then Jeff early yeah. in the show, in the show notes pointed out that Scythe did the thing with the actions. So the plastic units fight, wooden units don't fight. And I think wooden units are resources, I think is what it is, is the, what you're fighting over. Again, I, I had a bad experience with size, so it's not a game I know a lot about. I remember plastic mechs moving on the board. <laughs> and then cubes, if I remember, were all used to track your actions. Like they were all, you only use those on your board. So again, you wouldn't get them mixed up with the resources. All right, I'm not seeing anything else from the chat room. So we're going to wrap up this Ask the Bellhop episode section segment remember if you've got a game or game night question for us all you got to do is go to tabletopbellhop.com click on ask the bellhop fill out the form there or possibly even simpler is questions at tabletopbellhop.com today we're going to take a look at animal empire conquer or be conquered a high player count empire building card game from down under first up Thanks, Half Monster Games, for sending us a copy of this game to check out. All right, the card game Animal Empire was designed by Jack Ford Morgan and features art by Baron Chamberlain and Craig Lee. It was initially funded on Kickstarter in 2019 and is currently being published by Half Monster Games. On the box, Animal Empire claims to be for two-day players, but I got to say you need at least three, I think, to fully enjoy this game, and the more the merrier. Games seem to take about an hour, depending on player count. For a good look at what comes in the box, in this small box but high player count card game, check out our unboxing video on YouTube. And one of the first things you will notice about this game is the box. It is a very well-designed box. Like for a small box card game, it's thick and solid and chunky and it flips open like a, like a jewelry box or something. Like it's like more like a display case than a box. And I dig that. Yeah, certainly a box style you don't see often, but uh, it's only holding 56 cards. Yeah. But like compared to your usual like Uno box where you got to like open the flap and then you always have a hard time closing it because cards get in the way. This is so much nicer. Now inside that box is a two deck card tray, two, two stack of card card tray with a number of cards and a rule book on top. That's pretty much it. Rules are 14 pages long with 11 of that dedicated to explain how to play the game and the rest thanking all kinds of people because uh, play testers, um, Half Monster has a Patreon page and it was kickstarted. So they thank their Kickstarter backers. Despite some spelling and grammatical errors, uh, the rules are pretty straightforward. 
Um, they didn't take too long to get through. You can again, this is one of those games you could probably crack it open, read it while everyone else goes off to make a coffee. By the time they get back, it'll be good to play. I did find a couple things a bit ambiguous, but it was one of those ones where, like, here, can you read this? What do you think? And every answer we came up with doing that did match what the right solution was when I talked to the designer. So it, it was clear enough. Um, I do know there is a second printing of this rule book in the works that is going to fix all of the issues that have been addressed by reviewers and other people who have checked out the game. So that's already in process. Well, it's a shame some solid editing didn't catch errors, but it's one of those details that can really hurt a game's reputation because details matter. Yeah, the one that drives me the most is they spell specialization with an S everywhere instead of a Z. And every time, I, I don't know, that one just stuck out at me. And I called them on it and they're like, oh, it's got to be the European spelling, like the, the English, British versus US. And I'm like, no, I'm in Canada. I know the US. And then I Googled it. And I'm like, no, nowhere in the world seems to spell specialization with an S. Maybe they do in Australia. Maybe there's an Australian spelling of this. I don't know. Specialization meat. I don't know. Whatever it is, there, there was a couple others too. It, that wasn't the one, but that one was just glaring. I was just like, oof. Um, as for the cards, there's a number of different types. There's kingdom cards that have these nice fantasy landscapes, their landscape orientation as well. A matching army card for every kingdom, showing off some pretty um, kick butt looking units. Some wilderness event cards, which again have some nice artwork on them and text. And then crown cards, which are really boring. They're crowns and they're just eight, eight different colors. Card quality is okay but not great. Um, they look great. Like the, the printing quality is great. The arts, there's no bleed. Like everything there looks good, but the, they're a little thin. And I got to admit, every card that came out of my box is slightly warped. Now it's one of those things where just riffle shuffling them the other way seems to have fixed that. Um, they don't have any finish, right? They don't have like a linen finish or anything like that. And they are a bit glossy, which can be a problem depending on the lighting where you play. In my particular basement with my pot lights, it can be an issue. Uh, design and artwork though is fantastic uh the coloring is good the layout's good um it would have been nice to have that physical quality be just that step up like i i don't know who they got to print their game but i feel like they should have just you know did the five mil higher or whatever the next level of card would have been a nice touch my only real complaint about the art is that while they they spent some money and got some really great character design for each card they then copy and pasted that character multiple times to fill out the card uh, rather than you know paying for an, another another version of the uh, the monster, mm -hmm. um, you just get the same one copy pasted. It depends on the card though. Like some will have three guys on the card and they're all different, and then you look at the owls and they're all three the same. Well, you I, look if, at like if the you bowls. look carefully, they're actually just like they flip them sometimes and sometimes. Yeah, I was gonna yeah, say there was another one where it was a flip. Yeah, they, yeah they, there they, is they, definitely some yeah, copy pasted. There's, a, there's a, so that's unfortunate. But uh, now that we have an idea of what you get, cards and more cards, what exactly are you going to do with them? All right, so the goal of Animal Empire is to control a majority of the kingdoms. Each player starts with one kingdom and the army card associated with that kingdom and one random wilderness card. The remaining kingdoms are just scattered on the board or like the play area. Um, placed face down in the center of the table and the wilderness staff shuffled and put there. Nice, simple, quick setup. Yep. Each player's turn, they're going to take two actions. For each action, they do require to use one you to do that action. The actions to choose from are March, which lets you play armies from your hand, or move them from one kingdom to another kingdom, or go to the wilderness, which gets you a random wilderness card. Capture, which lets you take a kingdom and place it in your tableau, but only if you have a majority there, more cards than your opponent. Battle, where you force an opponent to take back one army from a kingdom you're both at. And four, seize the crown, which is kind of like capture, but instead of capturing a kingdom, you take the player's crown. Um, that makes that player your vassal. Now, more about this interesting mechanic in a bit, because it deserves being talked about separately. Note, you can never eliminate anyone. You can't take their last kingdom, which is that whole taking the crown. If you go to take their last kingdom, instead you take their crown. I mean... Three of those actions are really straightforward, but that fourth one just sounds so different from what we're used to in yeah, games. It is. It is very different. And again, I'll get to the vassaling system in a, in, a, in a little bit. That's what we're talking about on its own. Now, to make things more interesting, all of the armies have special abilities. All but one have one of the four special abilities, and then there's a dragon, and the dragon has all four of these abilities in one. So it's ridiculously powerful, to be honest. Fleet, which gives units extra movement. Attack, which causes opponent's armies to retreat when you move into a kingdom, so you don't have to use that separate action. Defend, which protects ones from attacking. And then Raiders, and what they do is after they capture a kingdom, they can then move to another kingdom. 
So not only are you fighting players, but a dragon? No, the dragon's actually one of the armies that oh. you can get. So if you own the kingdom of dragons, you get the dragon army. It's just one of the units that the players can control. Okay. Not a separate independent force in the game. Finally, we have wilderness cards. These are your event break the rule style cards they all do something special and they are very powerful like in a way when i first read my first couple i'm like wow that's huge that's too powerful but they're all like that so this is in um a few other games out there like this like uh the, the player powers and cosmic uh encounter for example or um um, Matainai is another game where like the combos just seem ridiculous but that's by design because by all of them being ridiculous it's kind of balanced now these can be played at any time and they do all kinds of things I'm not going to get into the details um, you can give units abilities that they didn't have you can return kingdoms to the center of the table allow players to rearrange kingdoms between them move units and all kinds of stuff now there are only 14 of these and what I like about that is that once you play like a couple times you're going to learn these 14 cards and you get to that chess like level where it's in a way perfect information it's going to be random which cards everyone gets but you know what all the cards are that are out there so do they recycle or are they one and done do you need is there a, is there a managing of them or when you play one uh it depends on the card some are you play it it's done and it goes in the bottom of the deck so it'll come back up other ones go into play like i had one that summoned this like cthulhu like monster and it counted as a unit and it had two of the abilities and it stayed in play until defeated but then once it was defeated it went to the bottom of the deck other ones were just like boom this character has this ability until the end of the turn another card stayed in play for an entire round and meant that this one kingdom couldn't be attacked like, it, it depends on the card but all of them do go back into the deck they all do they go to the bottom now, play just keeps going around the table like this until one side has the majority of the kingdoms, which in every player count is nine. Now, I know here I didn't say until one player owns nine kingdoms, and this is where we get to the vassal system. I said one side. When you capture an opponent's crown, that player becomes your vassal. You are now basically on the same team. You get to count all your kingdoms with your vassal's kingdoms to determine who wins, and if you get nine together between you, you both win the game. Know what I'm saying between you, but technically you can also have more than one vassal. And even your vassal could then have a vassal of their own, which sets up a chain of command. Um, it's even more important to know the only way anyone's going to get nine kingdoms is if you have a vassal. Like it's going to be impossible for one player to do it on their own, which is rather interesting. Except when you play two players, because then it's kind of weird. So uh, lead, lead or be led. There is no hope of hanging out on the side and sniping a win. No, this is not a turtle. I'm going to sit back. You're just going to lose if you do that one. Now, there is a bit more to the vassal system. I get into way more detail on the blog. But basically, the Lord can suggest the vassal do some things. But it's still up to that player if they choose to follow orders. And then there's a way to punish and reward vassals where you can take away or give them kingdoms. And then interestingly and they warn you that vassals may backstab you in the end and the only way they can actually do this is for another player to take the crown of the lord and what that does is then the lord becomes a vassal of someone else but all their vassals become free again so there's some interesting backstabbing teamwork there now in the end the actual winner of a game is going to be a coalition of players that will include the winning player and all their vassals who together have nine kingdoms right so for a multiplayer card game about animals, I really didn't expect this much liege lord action. No, not at all. I, I totally agree. And what's interesting is not just animals either. So one, one of the best things about Animal Empire is the, the the artwork is really neat. Plus, there is some background information. Each of the um the, the cards has a bit of flavor text that gets you a little bit of a look into this world, which at first I thought was like medieval fantasy and possibly even Roman because there's definitely a Roman aesthetic to many of the units. But it's like a mix of sci-fi and fantasy and there's there's demons and there's golems and there's a dragon. So it's not just anthropomorphic creatures. But they're definitely like there's zebra troops and there's elephant troops. So you got that going on too. Um, like from what I understand, there's a little brief paragraph introducing it. It's sometime in the different future where animals have evolved to be sentient. 
and then also somehow also became bipedal, which I've never quite understood that aspect of anthropomorphism. If they're why 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 being bipedal is better. What's interesting that I did not realize when I was first reviewing this game, and it wasn't until I was doing research for this review, that Animal Empire was actually originally a setting for a pen and paper role playing game, also published by Half Monster Games, and it was actually the RPG that was created first. And like for the fans of the series, this is like oh this is the board game version of Animal Empire. So that's kind of interesting. So all right, I guess that makes things a little bit more understandable. As a way of playing out the major actions of kingdoms in an RPG, the concepts start to make a lot more sense. Yeah, I get it. It, it, it fits. It, it's different, that's for sure. Now, moving past the art, let's, let's go to what we think of the actual gameplay. And I got to say this is a mixed bag. Like... Uh, the simplicity is nice. Like those four actions are really simple. Like, like it's not hard and you only have four options talking about making games simple. It's do I play a card? Do I kick someone out or do I conquer something I have majority on? Like that's it. Um, and, but the thing is like the rule books, like 11 pages, I just thought it was going to be more complicated, but that's it. Like, it's just, you get two actions, you take some things. And at first I liked it. I'm like, wow, this is nice and quick, but then it just started to feel the same. Like it just started to feel repetitive, especially if it's like, all right, someone tries to take my thing. I defend, I kick them out. Oh, they tried to take it again. I guess I better defend again. I kick them out. And it just seemed to go back and forth a lot. You attack, I defend, you attack, I defend. Now what broke that, and it's something we didn't realize in the first bit of play were the wilderness cards. And that's where things got mixed up is you would go back and forth and suddenly there'd be this big change to the game state because someone would play the, one of these powerful wilderness cards and that would mess with the status quo and all of a sudden things would start progressing again so how much of that that break up is is luck of the draw versus skill I think I, the big... again once you know the 14 different cards you could probably go fishing for them mm -hmm. definitely in your earlier plays it's going to be luck it's gonna be like, oh look at this neat thing i can do that breaks the stalemate but then later it could turn into i need to find that card except with eight players you have the cards more than half the cards are going to be in play at all time at the start of the game right so again it's it's got that element of knowing it but there is definitely luck on who gets which card right now, I also really like the bit that every kingdom had one army. Like, it just thematically made sense. If I take over this kingdom, I get that kingdom army, and I get to add it with all my armies in my hand. But you still only get two moves. So even having, like, a horde of armies didn't really mean you got to do a lot more. It just, I, I don't know, there's something neat about that. Like, it, to me, it reminded me of Shogun. Because in Shogun, when I take over a spot, I get the card for that spot. And now I have more options on my turn because I have that spot to use. But it, I, it, it's neat. I, I, there's some something about that. It was kind of neat. I, I can't say from hearing it. I can't say Shogun really leaps out at me, but I get from the experience that you're just where you're seeing that. Yeah. It's just, it's that collection of cards that give you more things you can do, I guess. Now the highlight here, the, the, like the killer app, the neat part here is that vassal system. It's kind of, it's a it's solid concept. Like it's an interesting thing. Like I had fun playing around with that and even having theoreticals, not that didn't come up during play, but just talking about how, well, if I vassaled you and you vassaled me, and this would happen and i i just get this feeling and i have no clue if i'm if i'm on or off here but i have this theory that jack came up with the vassal system and then built a game around it because like parts of the the aspect of it is like you can't win without it like oh i guess you could but like it'd be almost impossible to collect a majority of these like collect all nine yourself people like would just gang up on you and break them apart well if you then vassal the people teaming up on you like i i, I did like that and it adds an aspect of emergent play that i thought was really neat because you start off it's a battle royal it's everyone versus everyone but then it evolves into a diplomatic team-based game by the end. And that was a neat progression. Yeah. So, well, if you think, want to skip having both player elimination and multiplayer solitaire, you'd need to find some sort of collaborative solution. And that's what they've come up with. Now, the big problem with this whole Vassal system is it only works at higher player counts. Like, I would say this game's broken and not unplayable, but I wouldn't want to play it ever at two. Like, there's just, if I vassal the other player, I win. Like, well, I, or they backstab me and try to get back, but then I just take away their, like, it, it doesn't. It honestly, I don't think it, I don't recommend anyone playing with two, despite what the box says. At three, 
it's going to be two players team up on another. Like it's inevitable. That's what's going to happen. Is two players going to vassal and they're going to dominate the other player who's probably going to have no chance at that point. And that's just going to get into almost player politics more than actually playing a game. Now, when you get to four, it starts getting a bit interesting. You might get three people vassaled against one, or you might get two teams, or like the one person on their own is probably not going to do too well. At least it's, it's, it's a little bit more interesting. And of course, then it's going to get better going up from there. The, the more kingdoms, because part of it to think of too is with eight players, you got to collect nine to win. Well, eight are already owned, right? Like they're already out there. I got to steal them from players. I can't just go to the middle of the board to take them. And then it's definitely needs needs the higher player counts to really see that vassal system. Yeah, and I would say even four where it starts working isn't ideal. Um, and the game seems to lend itself a bit better to uneven numbers. So you're not just butting heads team on team. Yeah. Uh, five and seven would be my guess for the sweet spots. Again, I haven't played it yet, but I'm reading about it and, and looking at uh, some other reviews and, and discussions on uh, Board Game Geek and such seems like they're probably the the really sweet spots. Yeah, I could see that. I do dig the art. The setting seems neat. The vassal system seems like an interesting experiment. Like it's it seems like a game experiment and teamwork, cooperation, and eventual backstabbing. But all of this just felt like it, it needed more. Like it just didn't do enough for me. It, it felt like it almost felt like a subsystem that could be on top of another game, though. I don't know what else, like maybe a big empire game where you're moving units. And then this is an aspect of it for playing for like the, the seats on city council or something. I don't know. I, I don't know exactly what I'd do with it. Um, again, this really starts to show what it's good at its merit at higher player counts. And this is where I do almost recommend this game. I do like is that there are not a lot of games they handle eight players well that aren't party games. And that is where this game is, is going to come into the light is like, this is a full table of eight people with this vassal system and actual like tactics and strategy in a battlefield with compared to, you know, let's draw silly pictures or guest trivia. That's where I think it's going to be interesting. So if you have a big group, if you're one of those and you like everyone playing together, like personally, I get eight people together. I'm like, all right, two tables of four, let's go. But if you, everyone wants to play something together and you're sick of seven wonders, which doesn't work at eight, but if you get seven people, there aren't a lot of games that fit this niche. And that's where I think animal empire has some merit and, and, and some, some worth is at those high player count where you don't just want a light piece of fluff, a, a silly party game where you, actually want some negotiation some backstabbing some working together overall i i liked getting to check it out i'm glad glad half monster gave us a chance to look at it but i personally i wanted more i i think i'm gonna have a hard time getting to this one to the table very often going forward well for a more in-depth player uh, look at animal empire you can head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on reviews this would actually be a fun one where you if you were to you know plan a, a party night and do Animal Empire and Gorus Maximus. You just got, you know, get a big group of eight together and start yeah. back and forth between those. <laughs> this episode, we take a look at an RPG box set, Tales from the Loop starter set, based on the awesome artwork of Simon Stallenhag. Before we dive into this starter set, we need to thank Free League Publishing for providing us with an art, a review copy of this RPG. All right, the other thing we do have to note here is this is a read review of a role-playing game box set. Uh, at this point, due to the global pandemic, this is not a game I'm going to be able to get to my table anytime soon. So I haven't gotten a group together to play through this box set. So everything from this point forward is based on only reading the box set. But I have played a number of single sessions of Tales from the Loop. So I have played the game. I am familiar with the mechanics. I have played it at various cons over the last two years. And so I'm speaking as someone who's played the full game and familiar with the systems in this box set, but I haven't actually played like the adventure that's in this box set or with this slightly limited rule set. Right, shockingly, even I've played this RPG before, <laughs> and I admit I've also watched the entire TV series, which colors my thoughts about the setting somewhat. Yeah, at this point, I have not sat down and seen the TV series. So that is not impacting my views on this box set at all. Interestingly, the box set now has a sticker on it that says it's, it's not based on, but now a Amazon Prime series. When this was released, that wasn't out yet. Right. So there. Yeah. Sticker. <laughs> uh, all right. The Tales from the Loop starter set was designed by Matt Forbeck, Thomas Harnston, 
Nils Hintzy, Nils Carlin, with support from a wide range of people, Rickard Antonia, Christopher Grana, John R. John M. McCain, Costa Castulis, and T.R. Knight. It features art from the fantastic Simon Stallenhog. It's actually Stallenhog's art books, is his coffee table books, originally the first one being called Tales from the Loop, that is the inspiration for this role-playing game. Uh, this particular box set was published in 2020, just this year, from Free League Publishing. Uh, it features their Year Zero engine, which was from their most successful RPG, Mutant Year Zero, which is a D6-based system. Check out our Tales from the Loop starter set unboxing video on YouTube to see for yourself what you get in this role-playing mm -hmm. game beginner box. All right, I got to start by talking about the box itself. Uh, this box is nice. It's solid. It's, it's one of the most chunky solid nice pieces of cardboard rpg box sets i've had like it feels like a board game box not an rpg box set box which is a great thing because over the years so many rpg box sets are made of like cheap thin cardboard and they don't stay in the test of time this is the, the kind of thing like i don't know what they expect you to do with them like once you're done throw them out um this is a solid box that i think is going to be great for holding all my tales for the loop stuff going forward right i can keep the dice in there i can keep character sheets if we actually start playing a campaign i'll keep our our, our campaign notes and all of that in that box as for the contents of the box, I got to say, I, it's a little lighter than I had expected. It's a little sparse. Um, all you got is a set of 10 six-sided dice, a two-sided map, five pre-gens, and two rather thin rule books. Now, the look and quality of these are awesome. It's just not as much stuff. I just thought there'd be more in this box. Now, what I'll do is I'll take a look at each of those items in detail and share my thoughts on them. because So you can can know if it's, it's worth picking up for you. So... Up first is the dice. So these are custom Tales from the Loop six-sided dice. I am a sucker for custom dice. I like these 10 dice. You get 10 of them. It's the most you'll need to play. It's the maximum dice pool you can build in the game. Uh, note there is only one set you'd have to share between the players. Um, these are orange, which is a, it's, it's, got a, it's a certain distinct look. Um, I, I know it's a, it's a 70s, 60s DARPA kind of color look. I like it. And they're cool. They The numbers one to five are just numbers, but they have like a, a ring-like loop symbol on them. And they're, they're clear, easy to see, but it's a six that's replaced by something else. And it's it's the Reeks Energy, or I, Reich's Energy, I'm not sure how it's pronounced, but it's it's the Swedish company that owns the loop in, in the, the fantasy setting, the, 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 the setting, the fantastic setting for this. This makes sense because the only number that actually matters on these dice is the six when, we'll just, when trying to to actually get past trouble in the game like to be honest they probably could have blanked out the one through five but at least this way i can use the dice for other games yeah we'll just smile and nod at your addiction to dice i'm clearly yeah. not enough of a role player as i'm quite happy with the same ones i've been using for 25 years or so i don't know i think you're in the minority on that <laughs> one just just look at ttrpg twitter and, and see people talking about their dice constantly i like new dice 10 new dice, they're shiny, they work, and they're not only pretty, they, they are effectively made for the game. The sixes do stick out. Uh, next, you have character sheets. These are two-sided sheets. Uh, you got five different kids. On one side is a picture of the kid and some background information. On the front is a pre-filled out Tales from the Loop character sheet. Now, this is worth noting, this is a full character sheet. This is the same character sheets you're going to get in the full rule book. Nothing is skipped over or simplified. It's a fully filled out sheet. Um, each kid has both a Swedish and an American name, something that's a theme of this set. Uh, the kids include Linda or Aaron, the book room, Isabella or Patricia, the computer geek, Frederick or Chad, the jock, Tim or Timmy, the weirdo, and Maria or Kelly, the popular kid. Now, personally, I don't love having pictures on pregens. Uh, but I think that's a very personal thing. I, I'm sure many other people do prefer to have something else to guide them in how to play that player. Mm -hmm. I, I prefer the opposite where I'd like to make it a little bit more mine by not having that picture. But, totally fair. And there's in any game I could think of running and be like, if you don't like what's there, change it. <laughs> Now, the next one is the rules booklet. Uh, this is 32 pages, gives players the rules for playing a game using the Tales the Loop starter set, using the Year Zero engine, broken down into four chapters, with each of these broken down into sections. Uh, oddly, 
I don't know if this is a Swedish design thing because this game is published by Free League over in Sweden. There's no like table of contents, but each chapter has its page references broken down by sections, which was an odd choice. Now, over on the blog, I do break down this book literally chapter by chapter, section by section and go through all of it. But I think that's a bit much for the podcast. So what I'm going to do is summarize most of the book here without getting into all those details. As always, you'll be able to check out the blog for all the juicy details we can't take the time for here. Now, the Welcome to the Loop section is the first thing that introduces you to the game and what role-playing is, all the usual stuff. The thing that I think is worth calling out here are the core principles of Tales from the Loop. And I think it's worth listing these off. And for one, I have to give them props for having core principles. This is a, a modern concept in role-playing that, it, uh, I don't know if it was introduced in Apocalypse World, but that's a game that's most known for putting forth right at the front, right for everyone to know the principles of the game before you start playing. This is great for making sure that everyone at the table is on the same page. Now, the core principles for Tales from the Loop are, one, your hometown is full of strange and fantastic things. Two, everyday life is dull and unforgiving. Three, adults are out of reach and out of touch. Four, the land of the loop is dangerous, but kids will not die. Five, the game is played scene by scene. And six, the world is described collaboratively. Interestingly, that number one, that, that strange and fantastic things aspect was what I most missed. I, I turned out, in hindsight, from my initial experience with the uh, Tales from the Loop game. Yeah, and I don't know if that was the, the scenario we played, the, the game master we were under, but I agree. We I, it. I, yeah, it was... We were much more focused on it's the 80s and we're kids than yep. anything fantastic. Kids on bikes more than loop. Yes, definitely. Now, the next section is the age of the loop. This introduces the setting, which we've already alluded to quite a bit. Again, this is based on the artwork of Simon Stallenhog. This is a 1980s that never was, where repulsor technology, robots, teleportation, time travel, and two rather large hadron colliders have messed with reality and made much things much more interesting than the time period I grew up in. Uh, this is a setting that juxtaposes the mundane life of a kid and chores and homework and all that drudgery and bullying and all the 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 things that were great and terrible but being a kid with the fantastic of this messed up weird technology now interestingly two default settings are presented in this there's the malaran islands in sweden which makes sense a swedish game but there's also an alternative setting of boulder coral dorado in the u.s now I think it makes sense in the full game to do this, but it seems odd when there's only one scenario. Like even the names I listed earlier, they're not that much different from each other. Like I just don't quite see why. So from a technological point of view, I think the TV show really exemplifies this setting marvelously. Even if you're not interested in watching the show and there are some mixed reviews about it, uh, I'm sure on YouTube, there's probably a compilation video out there that will really give you an idea of the theme and the tone, which is the one thing mm -hmm. that TV show did really well. Another example of what I always picture is Lost for anyone who went through the series of Lost when they go back to the 60s and the whole DARPA or what Dharma, I think it was the Dharma Institute, the whole feeling of that I found never watched Lost. Yep. Okay. For anyone who's lost Lost, I, I, I get a lot of feeling of the Dharma Institute and the weird technologies and having to put in codes and very mechanical machines with counters that were analog. I, I found to me, that's the loop for me. For anyone, any fans of Lost, any fans for at least the beginning of Lost, because I don't think anyone was a fan of the end of Lost, <laughs> which is why I don't actually recommend you run out and watch it. Uh, the next section is the kids. This tells you how to read the character sheet with all the info on the means and uh, the stuff you'd expect. And then we get to the trouble chapter, which that is the key to this system. The game is all about the kids facing trouble. Um, no trouble, not monsters, not it, it's they have to overcome trouble. And this gets to the mechanics. Now, all conflict in the tail of the loop is handled from that viewpoint of trouble. It's the game master's job is to present the kids with trouble to overcome. And it's up to the players to find a way to get past that trouble. Note that's at a distinction from some traditional role playing games. It's up to the players to come up with how to get past the trouble, not the DM to present pre scripted solutions. Um, the way you get past this is they're going to use their attribute skills, items, and then pulling in some other resources like luck and their pride players are basically going to use those things to build a dice pool they're going to roll dice and look for sixes interestingly this is a dice pool system where all you need is one if you have one six at all the dice you win you did it you, you got it 
Now there is some additional rules where if you have extra sixes, you can get some additional effect. Now, if a player fails a roll, they immediately get the option to push themselves, which inflicts a condition on them. It lets them re-roll their dice, but it makes their kids upset, scared, or exhausted. There's a few others. Conditions can also be the consequences at failed attempts to overcome a trouble. So the trouble might be that there's a giant robot there in the street and it's patrolling the street. And if you don't get past it, you're going to be scared. Or if while running past it, if you fail your role, you might become exhausted or tired out from trying to get past it. Now, again, remember, one of the core principles of this game is that the kids, the characters cannot die. That is a very important thing when playing a game about children. We're not, this is not a, a, um, a voyeur style game, a, 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 I can't think of the term. Anyway, worst possible condition in Tales from the Loop is broken, which is the, the kid just can't do it anymore. They're done, which stops the character from taking part in confronting more trouble. Now there are of course additional details like what skills are good for what, working together, group checks, all the stuff you'd expect to find in a role-playing game. So for me, the key here is remembering that trouble should have a twist. Yeah. Trouble shouldn't just be a simple kid problem, though you can take a simple kid problem and add a loop twist to it to be that game, bring it to that game worthy level. Mm -hmm. Now, I do think it's worth noting that this is a very narrative focused role playing game. Everything is meant to be done driven by the narrative, which is the conversation happening between the players and the DM at the table. This is a very modern style of role playing game. You're going to see things that are popular in other games like Powered by the Apocalypse games, where like the results of dice rolls, I said you can spend extra successes. Well, those are things like ask the DM questions or the players being able to narrate something. It, it's, it's very much an the players and the game master are actively involved in building the world together during play. Right. So uh, many similarities with other modern RPGs, which will make it comfortable for those who play those, but can be unsettling for yeah. those used to more mechanical traditional RPGs. Now, personally, I think this one's, leaning more towards the mechanical traditional RPGs than many modern games compared to a Powered by the Apocalypse or a Fate game, this feels much more like the games I grew up playing. It just has some of those modern elements. Finally, the last book is the Introductory Mystery, which I don't even want to say the name of. I hate the name of this because to me it spoils one aspect of it. Like I think you're better off not knowing the name of this if you're going to be a player. Um, this is a short adventure, really short, like 16 pages. Uh, it does a really good job, though, of showcasing the setting and the tone of Tales from the Loop and the contradictory nature of the mundane life as kids of the 80s and the fantastical things around them. And, and that contradiction is really so important uh, to the entire setting. And it, it really features, I think, strongly in the art that Simon mm. has put out. Uh, there's Saturday morning cartoons, but a giant remote control robot bought outside the bedroom window. Yeah. Now, I do think it's worth noting the information in this mystery is presented to the Game Master as a series of facts. Uh, this is not a fleshed out story with a lot of details. There's no specific player options aren't spelled out. Like I said, this is not a game where you present the, the players with solutions for them to pick from. There's no box text, right? Like you're not getting your traditional, you read this out loud and something happens. It's more presented as a, here's what's going on. Here are the places the players will probably go and here's what you're going to find there. And here's what that information should lead them. And then here's the final scene that will play out that they should get to from that information. Right. So, um, to me, that's very much a uh, growing up. I, my favorite system was Warhammer fantasy role play. And one of the things I liked about that versus dungeons and dragons is it presented information this way. It would give you timelines and places and events that are going to happen. Then it was up to you to do something with it. Whereas, as opposed to at three o'clock, this is going to happen and the players are going to go this way or that way. So more narrative form, uh, more storytelling as opposed to uh, more on rails trad yeah. system. Now, that said, uh, it is only like there's only four locations in this entire thing. It's it, it, again, it's it's a taste. And that's it. That's what you get. You've got rule book. You got a sample adventure. You got characters and some dice. Now, before I get onto my thoughts, I do want to say I have some biases when it comes to this particular review. And I feel I need to talk about this. Now, this is in addition. I got a review copy, which I really don't think gives me a bias. But we already pointed that one out. For one, I love RPG starter boxes. I've mentioned it many times. I, I, I don't know. I collect them. I dig RPG starter boxes. I like seeing 
games distilled down to their simplest form. And to me, they're a great expression of what the designer thinks you should do with the game. It's here's what you're meant to do with my system. I love that. Plus, I like having everything in one box. And I love the shorter nature, the, the, the less commitment you have to apply to play them. I can get RPG starter boxes played with my normal group. Getting a long running campaign going is a whole another story. Second, I'm a big Tales from Luke fan. I played this game. I, I first played it at, um, I think it was Queen City Conquest. It was either that or Breakout, and I can't remember which. And immediately went to a booth at that con and bought a copy of the book. Like, like immediately after playing, I'm like, no, this is cool. And I didn't think I'd like kids on bikes. Like, I really didn't. But that game, Sean played in that game. That game was fantastic, and it scratched an itch I didn't know was itchy. Like, I, I had no clue. So before even opening this, I knew I was going to like the system and the setting. I, I played around with it. I know the setting. I know the system. I'm thirds up. Uh, second... We're both in our mid forties, grew up in the eighties. And I got to say, this is, um, I lived through the setting in here. Well, the non-fantastical <laughs> part and all, I'm all about eighties nostalgia and the references of the eighties. And I knew they'd be in here. There's mixtapes. It tells you what movies came out at different years. I'm like, yeah, I've seen every movie on that list. So I am definitely all for it. So that, that's, that's a whole bunch of biases I had before getting into this box set. Yep. Now, all that said, I'm going to try to judge this box on its own merits and share what I liked and some things I didn't. First off, as already mentioned, I, this was sparse. Like the, there just wasn't a lot here. Definitely less than I expected. I just thought there'd be more. Like you're looking at two books, thin books, some dice, a map, and some pregents. The books aren't that thick. The intro adventure is very short, short. Like this is a single session at most. Like I don't even think you're going to, you might even be able to, hammer this off depending on how much interaction you have um the, and then there's nothing to go past it like it's very much a distinct story that's done there's no additional information on how to create further mysteries or ways to make your own characters or even just like a blurb that says from here the players could go on to explore this and feel free to create that on your own but we should also note that uh Related to that, its MSRP is actually higher than a lot of other starter box sets. Yeah, it's not, I wouldn't call it expensive, but Just, this is, a, we've reviewed the Shadowrun box set. We'll mention it. I reviewed the Shadowrun 6th edition, 6th world box set recently. This is $5 more than that. I got, there's a lot more weight in books and things to read in that Shadowrun books. And there's cards and there's, there's just more there. The other problem I have with this one, which is similar to what I just said, is part of that is it's like many of the mystery style board games, like the exit games. This is a one and done. The only thing you're going to be able to use in this box to use in like the full game in Further Tales from the Loop is going to be the, the 10 sided dice and maybe the map. Like there's, there's nothing I would, I would have appreciated more meat, right? Like another small book, like how to continue your stories in the loop or a, a chapter in the back of the mystery saying, here's some follow-up things. Now that you've solved the mystery, here's some additional things, like just something, a denouement even. Now like I get it. Like the goal of this box is to make you want to buy the core rules. It, it, it's meant to be a taste, right? It's, it's make, meant to make you want more. And it does a great job of that. It gives you that taste. It gives you enough to make you want more. I just wish it was a bigger bite. Indeed, it is just a taste. And for some, that might actually not be enough to fork over for the full game. Yeah. It's fun, but if you don't get enough of a feeling for what more you can do in the system and with the system, it, it may not quite do it. Yeah, it's, it's hard to tell. Now, as for introducing new players, Tales from the Loop, again, I had already played, so I'm, I'm looking at this, trying to look at this objectively. I think this does a great job. Like it's a cut down version of the rule book, but like all the rules are there. It, it's not like they, they tacked it to bits and they only teach you part of it. Um, look back to those shadow run box sets for an example of where they did kind of hack it down. Like this is like almost like a quick start version of the rules. It's well written. It's well organized. It highlights all the year zero stuff. Like I actually expected it to be more cut down. I, I had a feeling it was going to skip over the bonuses. Like if you got a six, you succeed. And it wouldn't get into the fact that if you get a six on convince, you can ask the DM one of these five questions. I didn't expect that detail to be in here. So despite the fact I found the box bars rule wise, it was all there. Um, like in the characters, like those are full character sheets. The full details of the game are there. Yeah, though compared to say Pathfinder, the full rules as existed aren't as overwhelming to include in full. 
<laughs> yeah, true. Like, and to be honest, I have not read my Tales from Root Core rule book, but it's it's I don't know, 600, 400 pages. It's a big thick book. And I don't know, like maybe the rules are just as short. Um, but based on playing it, I didn't see much. But it's I think that's part of it, is just the the year zero system is simple enough to include all of the core rules in a short, small rule book. Uh, the mystery. I think it's a great introduction to the setting. Like, I really do. I don't want to give anything away, but this nails that feel of the setting and sticking to the principles of the Tales from the Loop, right? And showcases what makes Tales from the Loop different than every other kids on a bikes RPGs out there. Because there are a number now. When this first came out, it, it was a little bit more exclusive. Now, I do have a complaint about the mystery, and this gets back to the whole two settings in one book, the U.S. Swedish thing. And I think they they they, they fell down here because what they did is they include, it, it's written as if it's set in Sweden. And what they did is they're like, for U.S. players, we put orange brackets with the U.S. names for everything, but it's not consistent. They didn't do it every time. Like in one chapter, they use it, or one section, they use it, and the next, they don't. Or only the first time a name comes up in a section, do they put it? So like, you have to remember them all. Um, most of Regis is, there is player handouts that you can download online that are in the book that aren't, that don't do it. So if I'm playing in the US and I hand you a note and it's giving you clues that certain people were certain places, all the names are wrong. Like all it features is that the Swedish names, like this is frustrating enough. Like, as I said earlier, I think they should have just went, it's in the U S or it's in Sweden or don't even mention the names. Maybe like just use the same names for the Swedish. And like, why, why even give me two different names? Yeah. The locations would be different. Like it, it's a really odd design choice. I, honestly, I don't know that the setting and by setting, I mean the location, not yeah. the, not the overall setting and theme, but I just, Maybe for U.S. players, it's a deal breaker, but I don't see the point of locking it down to a specific city in a specific, you know, state or I mean, kids, especially because kids of a certain age don't really have that concept of global geography. Often the town is the world and things outside of it are something you wonder about, not necessarily need to be detailed. So if you said this is the name of the town where the loop is. Mm -hmm. and didn't specify a country or a state or anything else you'd be fine <laughs> no i totally agree I, it's, it's it's an odd choice like i don't know why like especially in this like do that in the full rules that's why the book can be this thick present yeah. me with two detailed settings why they did it for this is i find an odd choice i have to assume it's it's a, it's the concept that the americans won't want to play in sweden like the, the north americans though I, as a canadian i don't care i'll play in boulder colorado but we're, we're a little less uh nationalistic so maybe that's all it is i don't know overall though i gotta say i really dig this box set like like yes it's sparse i wish there was more there it, it'd be nice if they gave me more stuff but this is still a great introduction to the tales of the loop setting and system as an introduction box it does what i want it to do if you're at all curious about Tales from the Loop, just like go get this. It's not that expensive. If you're curious about this RPG, pick it up. Now, where I can't recommend this one is if you've already got the core rule book, and I'm speaking as someone who does, there's nothing really here. Like I, I checked it. You can go um, on Modifius's website or Free League Publishing's website and buy the dice. The core rule book comes with five mysteries. So I don't think you really need the little short 16 page one. Like the only thing that might be in here that's never, not anywhere else is a map. Do you really need a two-sided map of Boulder, Colorado and with a ring on it to show where the loop is? Like, I don't know. Uh, now the caveat of course, is if you like collecting RPG box sets like me, you might still want to pick this up. But if you're looking for new content for your Tales from the Loop game, I, I don't see, like if you already got the core rule book, you're probably good. For a more in-depth look at the Tales from the Loop starter set, you can head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Reviews. And now, the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here, what games hit our tables. We almost should rewrite this for the pandemic because <laughs> we don't do a lot of events right now. Virtual There's tables. There's not a lot going on. Yeah. There's some virtual tables. But yeah, every week we like to do this look back. This is a, this is a common board game podcaster thing where we talk about our week in review and what games we played. Kind of short mini reviews. Plus it gives you a good idea of what kind of games we play now and then and what we enjoy. 
Now, I will say we did play some games this past week. Uh, Animal Empire is one of the biggest ones. Uh, that was with the family, the in-laws. Um, my oldest seemed to enjoy it quite a bit. Uh, Deanna had the most interesting reaction to it, which is we, we covered in the review earlier, where she really liked it at first. Like, oh, this is neat. This is more than I thought it would be. But then went, eh, maybe not, <laughs> as it went on, especially with that back and forth. Now, everyone did agree the art looks awesome. Um, I got it, man. I'm slightly tempted to check out the RPG because the world and the setting in that seems really cool. As for thoughts on this game, you just got those during the review segment. And again, without the benefit of high player counts, I can see why D might have faded on the game. Now, the other game I got to the table was a nice, big, chunky, heavy one, and that is Veenhost Deluxe Edition from Eagle Griffin Games. I got to say that the last couple of weeks with going to uh, my in-laws over to, to, to visit has been nice. Cause like we got out early on Vinhos and that has been sweet. Like I like later games. I'm, I'm, I have fun playing breakdancing meeples and talisman Batman was fun. And even super cats with its silly super cats. It was nice though, to sit down and play some nice meaty heavier games. Yeah. I don't think anyone who's a regular fan of this show would doubt that a bit of Euro meat on the table is something that is always going to hit the spot. Like, no fillers will yeah so we've been playing these with Deanna's mom and i gotta say i'm impressed like she's been really enjoying these heavier games like i was worried they'd be a bit much like like i know she loves Catan and she likes to take it to ride but like this is a step up right um i she's still on a bit of a heavier game learning curve right like it's a little more to think about than usual but she's been having a lot of fun and one of the ones that amused me last week we were in the middle of playing uh orleon actually at the time and she we, we were taking a break to make some coffees or whatever and she's like i know what i don't understand is where were these games when we when you were a kid like these would have been great to be playing years ago and we were like well you know mom they didn't exist like that's why we call them modern harpy board gaming well she's catching the bug and next up she's going to be following at tabletop underscore deals on twitter yeah I, she does own a few she owns Catan. she owns ticket to ride she's got roll for it but yeah i'd like to see her start getting some heavier stuff now regarding Vinho specifically uh we played a three-player game the 2016 vintage went really well um, I'm definitely getting better at teaching this one for pointing out what's important. Um, I brought this up during our conversation on how to make games easier to teach earlier today. And that's the fact that one thing it does really well, the Vin host is great at is tying that theme to the mechanics. And that got showcased extremely well teaching Brenda. Like she picked up on most of it right away and she kept saying, well, of course that just makes sense. Now she did have a bit of a hang up with the differentiation between wine quality and value. And I get it because that's one of the things that it's, it's one of the core concepts of the game that many players stumble on. And, and I think most real life so-called connoisseurs also stumble on that. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure they probably do. Uh, overall, I'm still digging Venos. This is a good game. Uh, this is one of the better, heavier games I own. Like I, I'm, I'm looking forward to getting this to the table a bit more in the coming weeks. Well, how about a look ahead? Well, one of the things on my wish list is to try Vinhos 2010 Vintage. So the, the version of Vinhos I'm playing is the newer Eagle Griffin printing that came out in 2016 that is actually an update to the original Vinhos, which was published in 2010. And one of the things this deluxe box set includes is a new refined, streamlined, supposedly a little easier to play version, and the original, just a few tweaks. So I am looking forward to checking that out. Um, I actually left my copy of the game, but I've got the rule book literally right here. So it's sitting here to look at, to try to figure out. It looks like there might be some market elements. So I think we're looking at a Steam versus uh, 18xx level of change here. It's definitely rated as heavier on Board Game Geek, so that'll be interesting. So yeah, I'm looking forward to getting that one because I do want to, I do want to, we're going to get a review up on that one pretty soon. Uh, I got a pile of stuff to unbox and Sean pointed out today. I didn't realize we're down to our last unboxing video It's going to go live on Monday. So Monday, you're going to get to see founders of Gloomhaven, the Gloomhaven game. That's not a Gloomhaven game, a Gloomhaven game in name alone. Um, and I got a ton of stuff to re record. I got some new stuff to check out. So I need to do that. Um, I also want to start playing Hogwarts Battle again with the kids. With them back at school, I don't know how that's going to work out, though. So we'll see. Depends if homework starts piling on or if the school days keep ending right at three and then they're free. Because I have one of the things in the pile is an expansion for the game. So that's on the list. And um, I forget. I had looked at what we were going to review next week, and I completely am blanking. <laughs> on what Vinhos were hoping. 
I'm going to look this up because by me, Vinhos. Oh, I didn't actually color code it. I don't know what it was. Uh, probably one of the games that I'll unbox. That's what it was because we have a bunch of stuff from the op and some of them are lighter. So we're looking at like Ratuki is a quick game. The Harry Potter, we probably won't get to, but there's a, a Harry Potter House Cup, which is a Harry Potter worker placement game or Scooby Doo Escape the Haunted Mansion. So yeah, it's stuff I hadn't opened yet. So that's why I didn't have it here. So it's going to probably be based on how the unboxings go, like what looks the coolest out of there, what I'm excited to play. And I do have some no new stuff coming, which is pretty cool. Um, we just made a contact with, I'm trying to wait for it to load uh good games publishing that's the name of it. i couldn't remember the publisher good games publishing is supposedly sending us some games to check out so the pile of obligation is literally this close to being done so i got to pile more stuff on it right like you can't let it hit zero that'd be wrong i'd be like working on my own pile of shames which is like <laughs> we haven't done that since our first year of podcasting all right now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. All right, up first, a big welcome to our latest Patreon patron. Welcome, Matt Lick. Sorry, Lichten Walner. Walner. Lichten Walner. I apologize, Matt. I I had pronounced that when I put it in the notes like three times, but now that I got to it in the show notes, I'm falling all over. Matt L. Matt Lichten Waller is what I'm thinking. That that's that's my Warhammer Fantasy Battle Warhammer Stein Hogger and the the, 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 the Stein Holler incident. Lichten Waller. I'm going to go with Matt Lichten Waller. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Thank you for becoming a patron of the Tabletop Bellhop. And thanks to our existing patrons, including. Roger Malosh. Thanks, Roger. Man, we got to play again together. This is weird. Like, like Roger, like I game with every Saturday for like the last year and a half. It's been weird. He's been doing all kinds of awesome game design stuff on Facebook though. So if you find Roger Malosh, he's he'll, he'll send you, send Roger Malosh on Facebook, uh, a friend request. He's working on some game design projects. He's got some cool stuff going on. Zopi. Thank you. David Miller Jr. Thanks, David. Brian Kurtz. Thanks, Brian. Yuho Rutila, thank you. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end and we're going to have to drop the portcullis. Though the doors to the lobby are closed and the portcullis is down, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. I feel like the content we're providing, especially if you notice things are getting better and things are lit better and my videos better, that is all thanks to our awesome patrons, of which you can become one of by going to patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. New York, Toronto time and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast to hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. every Tuesday. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us and stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game on. Game on. <laughs>